call and we'll have a roll call and uh, then introduce the staff and anyone from the public who wants to speak. So uh, can you do a roll call for us? Yes. Chair James Marston. Here. Vice Chair Robert Burnham. Here. Skylar Kovich. Here. Nick Kuntz. Here. Karen Luckett. Here. Michael Razzler. Here. Suzanne Tejada. Here. Megan Harmon. Brian Damore. Here. Sarita King. Here. Thank you. Okay. Uh, number three, committee member reports and staff what, announcements. What, what about introducing the, the members of the, of the staff and public? Well, we already heard from Brian. Who was uh, doing the roll call? Raymond Lamb. Raymond Lamb. Okay, thank you. All right. I was uh, speaking with Jim Dewey a few weeks ago, and he told me he was retiring, and he wanted me to announce that for the AAC. So he was the, the guy in, in charge of the streets, operations, and infrastructure, and also was the only CASP from the Public Works Department. So at some time during this uh, meeting, I'd like to hear who's taken over that position, if, if we could figure that out. And I have a few more things here. I did meet with uh, Brian Bossy from Downtown Parking, which I'll report in my ad hoc, but I wanted to bring up something here. I asked Brian, uh, since there's no real way to file complaints on parklets that are in violation, he said they should go to Brian as the ADA coordinator. But as you probably can imagine, many people don't like to file a report and a complaint with their name on it because of vindictiveness uh, with the restaurant owners or the city or whatever. Brian, is there any way that we can file reports or complaints that don't have names attached to them? Or can you think about that? Uh, Chair Marston, um, so you're, you're looking for a way to file a report to notify staff, but to not have your name or somebody else's name yeah. attached to that. Anonymous. Right, anonymously. Um, I will need to think about that and okay. get back to you. I mean, it's, it's one thing to call downtown parking and say, by the way, you missed something on this parklet, but then to have a formal thing with your name on it, then it looks bad. Maybe you want to be reappointed to this committee. Maybe you want to just go to a restaurant. And it's a little tricky in a small town to, to have to have your name on that stuff. So see if there's a way we can do something. Okay. Understood. Yes. Thank you. Uh, if I may, um, recently was uh, at Cottage Hospital for the cardiac rehab program. And interesting in terms of the parking situation there, where they have uh, both handicap parking and charging stations for electronic vehicles in the lot that they opened up. And while the parking is free, obviously handicapped uh, and the electronic stations are for specific people to use. And I overheard a number of times where uh, fellow recovering <laughs> uh, patients we're talking with the staff there, and the procedure is really very simple. If you see somebody in violation, a car in the handicap spot without the placard, without the license plate, or a non-electronic vehicle in the electronic you know, vehicle charging spot, you report it at the main desk, and they have you know internal security and whatnot. Uh, at Cotton Cottage may be a unique situation. I don't know how their policing works or how that works with, but you didn't leave your name. You didn't file a report. You let administration know, and they went to their security people, and they took care of it. And you know, I would think something like that. It should be that simple. You report it, and somebody handles it. Yeah, I think the, the government in general allows a lot of anonymous complaints for different things. I'm not talking about city, but I'm talking about state and federal. You can report anonymously. So Karen, your mic's not on. Your mic on. So um, it would seem that we should be able to do something so serious in the city. It, it, it's a common sense thing yeah. uh, to me. It, it's Well, that's what I was hoping for. Hopefully we could have just an anonymous phone line that people could call in and say, 
I wasn't able to be served in this place and haven't looked into it without having to put names on it. If you could look into that, it'd be helpful, I think. Uh, Miss Suzanne Tejada is our architect, who is also on one of these State Street ad hocs, and she has to leave early today. So I asked her to give an update uh, on what's going on with your group. Yes, um, um, the State Street Advisory Committee had a meeting on Thursday, October 27th with the new consultant that has been hired by the city MIG to work on the master plan. And um, they are right now, what they did is they presented all of the research and information gathering that they've been doing in the last couple months, um, meeting with different groups and in, in, um, stakeholders is what they call them. Um, so for example, the downtown parking committee, they've met with the downtown organization, um, lots of other groups there um, meeting. Um, yeah, so they have a whole list of outreach. Um, in general, the question I've been getting a lot from people is if I'm not part of a group, how do I get my opinions or uh, information of what I think to the team? And um, they, uh, so what they've done is they've created a website on a special website for the State Street. And I can pass this form out. Um, which gives information here. Uh, just pass it down. Yeah, and also the website, the new website is Create State. Uh, yeah, I forget the name of it. Um, it's all uh, uh, for visually impaired and also they're, they're, everything is sort of um, accommodating for different users. Um, so so what they're, what they're doing right now is doing an outreach program to the community to get input from everybody. And there's a survey on that website that they want people to take. So that's a one way to get your opinions to the, to the team. Um, on November 3rd and 4th, they had an event on State Street um, where they had one of the empty um, businesses was set up where people could come and talk to the team and ask questions and they had a lot of information out there. Um, there will be another community engagement event on December 9th and 10th. Um, and the, that location right now is tentatively scheduled to be in the old Sur La Tabla space on State Street. Um, and so that that's that's right now is the, is the time where you know we need we can get our opinions out there and our thoughts and talk to people and and then they'll move into the next phases of starting to come up with specific solutions or ideas. Um, so. Yeah, buddy, for a second. Yes. I appreciate this flyer. Is this available online for the visually impaired? That I do not know, okay. but the website. Okay. Is listed on the flyer. Is listed on the flyer. And I can read that out. That'd be great. Um, so it's statestreet.santabarbaraca.gov. That's the, the website and the, the, the survey is on there. That's the first button. Um, there's a lot of information on that website. There's also an email. Um, if you have questions, that's statestreetmasterplan at santabarbaraca.gov. So this flyer is a little old because it talks about November 3rd and 4th, but um, I think the website is the critical way to communicate. Thank you. I have a question, Susan. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I know the Santa Barbara Architects also did an online survey that a lot of people yes. uh, gave input into, and they also did their design charrettes. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, were, were those public comments and the local architects, are they taken into consideration by this consultant? Do you know? Well, that is a really good question because they, they, they do know about the charrette. They do know about the documents that were produced. And um, I've told the AIA about, uh, so basically they're in the process of, of doing, the AIA is in the process of connecting with the consultant to do a presentation. 
I don't have any details of when that's going to be, but there that will be, um, they will communicate. Okay, good. And, and the planner that is in charge of State Street, which is Tess Harris, um, she's she's definitely the gateway, you know, to to reach out to 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 get to whatever you need to do. So um, Tess Harris is the planner with the city. Um, she's, she's a State Street master planner. So yes, that will happen. That that they will know about the charrette. Oh, Sus good. Suzanne, this is Bob. I have a yes. question. Um, I don't know if you're aware that um, some People from Westmont College are organizing a walk on State Street next Wednesday, the or the Wednesday the 30th, I believe it is, from 8 until 9.30. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what exactly. They want to talk about um, State Street and how it um, interacts with the whole city. I'm not sure if Tess is even aware of this walk or if there's any kind of coordination between the, the two entities, but this walk sounds like it was and Skyler knows something about it too. Right. I think. Yeah, I can forward you information if you would like. I know that the <laughs> the Westmont was on the list of groups that they were reaching out to. So I don't know if Good. that was something that was initiated okay. by Westmont or if it's in conjunction with MIG or it's not the college itself. Oh it's a, I see it's a group of uh, kind of a lot of people who have connections there. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I can forward you the information too. Sure. Yeah, I mean that, that that this is this is definitely a time I, where you can this is where your voice can be heard, where it should be heard, because Good. that's what they're doing right now. So our next meeting is on December fourteenth um, at the Faulkner Gallery. Um, so anybody is welcome to come and listen in on that, or it's probably online as well, um, and have public comment. Do you know the time of the meeting? It is usually, let's see, it cha it's changing um, from 3 to 6 p.m., but it might be 4 to 7 p.m. That's not final yet. Okay. Suzanne, just um, generally speaking, what is your sense of, of progress on the State Street Plan as it relates to accessibility? Um, I, I know that everyone's talking about it as being a concern. Do you mm -hmm. see any substantive uh, actions to, to, to ensure that the accessibility is being addressed? Or are we not even to a point where, where it comes into play yet? Well, I would say that it's not, there's nothing to look at and, and, and there's, it's not at a point that comes into play yet. Okay. Because it's more in the research. So, for example, they pre they pre when MIG presented at the last meeting, they presented um, statistical data about retail, about um, you know business. I mean, there we're not at a point where we're looking at designs or okay. specific solutions to anything. Accessibility is definitely going to be um, considered. I don't think we have to worry about that. Yeah. I would like to believe that, but I, you know, we shouldn't have had to worry about it during the this, the parklet fiasco either. I'm not going to comment on that, yeah. <laughs> but um, uh, in my opinion, in what I've seen, um, I think that MIG is being, you know, this is something they do, and they they're being very thorough and um, responsible to, you know, the city is their client. They're right now trying to figure out who their clients are, which is uh, like uh, they're trying to design it for Santa Barbara. We're the client. So they're trying to find out what we want. And that's kind of where they're at. Great. Thank you. Are there any other committee reports or staff announcements? I have um, a report. Okay. Um, I saw a lot of good press recently regarding the 17th annual Mayor's Awards uh, in recognition of National Disability Employment Awareness Month. And it got me wondering about how the word nominees are, are chosen. And it strikes me as just the exact type of thing that this committee is intended to assist staff with, and yet we're conspicuously left out of the loop. And uh, I think it would be great for the AAC to have more positive public engagement. And um, so I was talking to Chair Marston about it. And um, we discussed forming an ad hoc committee to investigate how the AAC might contribute to this annual award event. And, uh, or if 
participation, our participation was not welcome, um, how we might similarly honor those um, that this committee recognizes. I'd like to honor um, uh, <laughs> Jim Dewey um, in some way, recognize his efforts um, towards accessibility here in Santa Barbara. Um, uh, there's, I think that instead of just being this element of, of the municipal advisory that, that is very critical of accessibility issues, I'd like to also be proactive in, in recognizing, um, you know, positive uh, things that we see. You know, I'm sure that there are great parklets out there that we could uh, recognize and, and try to encourage people to do the right thing instead of just complaining about those who, who do the wrong thing. Um, I was going to ask Ms. Tejada if she would join Jim and I on this um, proposed new ad hoc committee, but I also wanted to hear from the rest of the committee if, if, if you think that this is a worthy endeavor for, for the AAC to pursue. Definitely. Yeah, I, definitely. I think it is, Jim. Nick. Hello. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree that it would be a great uh, effort to have. We could go on and do a few architects who are doing a good job with accessibility, restaurants, retail shops, anyone who's actually worked hard to make physical accessibility. I think, Nick, what you kind of skipped over was that the mayor's breakfast was always for employment for people with disabilities. That's the primary okay. award. Right. Um, but as I looked That's into it, it they, they did recognize others, um, okay. an, an architect uh, yeah. for, and a nonprofit, et, et cetera. So the, there was more than one award given. And, you know, I'd, I'd just like to um, be a part of that. And um, maybe they're, you know, on the coattails of that event, maybe the, the AAC could recognize, you know, uh, one or two uh, organizations a year from our perspective. I agree, that would be nice. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's Michael Rassler. Um, I don't think we need to, to duplicate what's out there or recreate, um, you know, if it's not necessarily broken, we don't have to fix it, but we should participate. I think you're hundred percent correct. There's a system out there now is what I'm hearing. And I'm, I wasn't aware of this at all that is recognizing and acknowledging um, organizations or individuals in the community that do good things in, in the arena that we work in. Um, wonderful. We should absolutely be a part of the process of identifying and be able to contribute recommendations and suggestions for uh, nominees or awardees. Yeah. Uh, I, I think we ought to be both individually, you know, as community members that are knowledgeable and, and aware, as well as uh, as a whole committee, as the AAC itself ought to be involved uh, throughout the community in any and everything that touches on uh, the, the accessibility disability world. Yeah. So I 100% you know, agree, we, we should absolutely be there. If, if there's a, um, if there's a, a formal reason or a structural reason why we're not <laughs> allowed to participate, that needs to be addressed. Yeah. I'm just not aware that that's yeah. the case, but you know, certainly we, we should get those notices, you know, that nominees are being sought. You know, that should just, you know, right. every committee of the city should get one of those. We're a committee of the city. We should get one of those. That gives us a chance to then talk about it and, you know, put in our, our nominees. It's just, again, yeah. it's a kind of a common sense thing structurally. Well, it turns out that this whole event, they call it the mayor's award, but mm -hmm. the, the mayor didn't even know about it till somebody put it on his calendar. Um, <laughs> and, um, but the whole thing is put on by staff and we are the access advisory committee to staff. And I'm really, I mean, it strikes me as more than odd. I'm almost offended that, that we're excluded. Well, that's my question. Is it, are we excluded well, consciously yeah. or is it just by historic act and function? So, you know, I would kindly ask our staff 
to you know, ask the staff who is involved in the mayor's awards that when they're requesting nominees for whatever awards they are, to please forward that communique to, to you us. so you can share it with this committee. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just gonna jump in here real quick. Um, I've been with the city for 15 years, and this is actually the first time I'm hearing about mayor's awards. So I've never seen emails myself come through asking about what that process is or right. uh, requesting nominees. So I'm curious, you've piqued my curiosity. Um, I can check in with the administrator's office, learn more about what this process is, and I'd be happy to report back um, what I learned. Great, and, and there may not even be a formal process, in which case we have an opportunity to you know kind of kickstart one. And and since this probably you know moves quickly, and and this committee only meets quarterly, I think it makes sense to to get an ad hoc going so that we could make some headway between <coughs> quarterly meetings and and report back uh, quarterly to this whole committee. And so, unfortunately, I, I was really, I thought this would be a really perfect fit for Suzanne and she missed the presentation. Um, but uh, I'll really quickly recap the, the um, mayor's 17th annual um, uh, award recognizing National Disability Employment Awareness Month uh, took place earlier this month. And um, I want to get this committee involved and I want to start an ad hoc committee. And the whole thing is I, I, I rather than just be, you know, critical of accessibility, accessibility failures, I'd like to be a part of, you know, the positive interaction, recognizing um, the, the positive accessibility uh, in our community. And um, I want to form an ad hoc. And I thought that this would be something that uh, you would might be interested in joining. Would you? Yes, definitely. Okay, great. So Chair Marston, Tahada, well, Suzanne Tahada and I. Um, I just wanna jump in again, sorry, but uh, we, we're in um, committee member reports and okay. staff announcements. There's nothing agendized about this particular item. My, my so. understanding is you only need two members to, to inform you that we've formed an ad hoc. Okay, maybe that's happened in the last year while I've been gone. Um, I'm not aware. Of that, to me, uh, an ad hoc is a formal okay. action of the so, body. So it, you, I'll follow up with you. If if it's not uh, appropriate for Brown Act or whatever reason that we form an ad hoc now, we'll we'll wait till the next quarterly meeting. And um, if if we don't see a reason why not, it'll stand. Fair enough. Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks. I just thought in my two cents. I think the rules are that the uh, chair and any other member can form an ad hoc, but you're right, we don't, we can't discuss the stuff now, but we can form one technically. But you can, uh, if you wanna look into Chair it. Chair Marston, I, the, the ad hoc is a formal process. Three, mem three members can meet and talk about topics outside of this committee right. at any time. They have to be careful not to extend that to a fourth member. Um, but once we recognize it as a formal, ad hoc committee, then that's gonna require um, an action uh, and an agenda item. Okay. But there's no problem with three of us meeting to talk about things. That's correct. And if all you're saying is we have to wait till next meeting to actually formalize it, that's just paperwork. Okay, let's, right. let's put it on the agenda for next meeting. <clears throat> that's all I have. And just to throw out, I met with the mayor a few weeks ago and we discussed this a little bit and he had no idea. Nick said, but I think that Holly Perez is it? Uh, Holly Perea? Perea. Perea yeah. Is actually the one who put this all together. So, Brian, if you're actually going to follow through, maybe you start with her. And basically, we're just asking can we just make some suggestions or nominations more for the physical access side? All right. Uh, Brian, do you have any staff announcements? Uh, real quick, Chair Marston, I do have a couple of announcements and I when I looked at this agenda today, I thought, wow, we're going to get to, to the 10 o'clock item before 10 o'clock, but uh, we're already behind schedule. So just trying to be mindful of that. I'll go quick here. Obviously, um, I'm back in the seat here. I returned to Public Works in October. Um, I've been back in my role of city engineer for a few weeks now. Uh, Ashley is uh, back 
in the, the water world, um, in water resources engineering as principal, I understand. And I'm not at all surprised to hear that she did a great job um, while I was away. So I'm glad that uh, things have been going um, well, although I know we have some challenges and um, ex excited to see um, the report that was put together on some of the goals for the year ahead. Um, so that's one thing you mentioned, Jim Dewey retiring. Uh, Derek Bailey is acting uh, currently uh, and uh, Director Maurer will be speaking a little bit later if you had any specifics on that transition, uh, he could give you more detail. Um, I think you're all familiar with Derek Bailey. He's been around for quite a while. Um, I think that's it on staff announcements. Uh, well, sorry, there was one last thing. Uh, advisory group appointments. Uh, I understand that will take place on December 6th. So I think we have maybe one or two. I'm not sure how many seats are open on this yeah. committee. My, my term is expiring. Um, there was a kind of a breakdown in communication. We normally hear when there's a vacancy coming up and I only got uh, informed by uh, accessible Santa Barbara that um, I, my term, I was terming out and uh, I had like three hours left in the day to uh, submit my application to be reappointed, which I did and I've interviewed, so. That's it. A quick question for Sarita, are you still there? Yes, I am. Okay, you know how we set up a little thank you uh, certificate for members who have left the committee? I'd like to get something to Ashley. So can you use that same form and just uh, give her a little certificate of appreciation? How about Jim Dewey as well? I will uh, connect with Brian and we'll see what we can do. Okay, that sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have... Uh, Public comments now for things that are not on the agenda. Do you have any? Uh... There are no requests to speak okay. on Zoom or in person. Okay. We saved some time. <laughs> okay. Does anyone have anything about the minutes that they want to discuss or edit out? If not, I'll entertain a motion to. I, I move to accept the minutes. Okay. Second. Okay. Can you have a roll call for accepting the minutes, please? Yes. Uh, Suzanne Tejada. Aye. Michael Rausler. Aye. Karen Luckett. Aye. Nick Kuntz. Aye. Skylar Kovich. Aye. Vice Chair Robert Burnham. Aye. Chair James Marston. Aye. And just like that, we're back on schedule. Okay. <laughs> now we have time to hear from the Public Works Director, Mr. Cliff Maurer. Morning, uh, Chair Marston and committee members. Uh, my name is Cliff Maurer. Uh, brief introduction, I've been with the city since August of last year, so a year and three months now. Uh, prior to coming to the city, I was public works director, actually formerly public services and engineering director for the city of Coronado uh, for seven years. And then prior to that, I served as a civil engineer corps officer in the Navy for uh, 30 years. Um, I wanna start off with an apology that this is the first time being at this meeting and it was not a deliberate choice on my part. It just unfortunately that our city administrator holds an executive team meeting on Friday mornings um, every other Friday. And so therefore, just by the nature of the schedule, they, um, uh, conflict with this meeting. And uh, there's one going on this morning. I was able to attend uh, the first hour of it uh, and talk about pretty weighty subjects such as the city's financial condition and, and what we need to do going into uh, future year budgets and those processes. So it's uh, very important. And unfortunately we can't provide, uh, the rules of that meeting are, I, I, we can't provide substitutes. It's just the actual. So, I want public works to be represented, I have to be there. 
but uh, it is important that I'm here. And uh, kind of my second point is that uh, um, the, the city, certainly my department and me personally uh, understand uh, the importance of accessibility and our responsibility to upholding the law, American Disabilities Act. Uh, for those of you who can't see me, I am a little over six foot 10. And though I'm not covered by the ADA, my height condition, uh, it definitely uh, presents some accessibility issues, uh, <laughs> especially if you fly commercial. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, uh, and, and I, it is minor. I, I deal with it. Uh, it's no problem. Uh, but I, I absolutely uh, value and appreciate uh, what you bring to the city uh, in the way of firsthand perspective, expertise. And uh, it's really important uh, for my staff and the city to, to hear that so that we can do what is right in those areas. Um, I did want to, just because I think I know, I'm not positive, but regarding the ad hoc committee and the formality is, is for the agenda that goes, uh, uh, that, that you're working off of today is traditionally formed between the chair and the staff representative, in this case, Mr. DeMore. And uh, uh, if there would be an item that maybe the chair wanted to put on or other committee members wanted to put on, maybe the chair wasn't excited about or that Mr. DeMoor uh, decided, no, I don't wanna put that on the agenda. I think the rule you're applying to is any two committee members can write a two person memo. Uh, and if they agree, then that will be agendized uh, at the next agenda. Uh, but uh, regarding formation of the ad hoc committee, I think Mr. Moore is correct that that does, and that can go on the next agenda, but that does need to be agendized so that the public under the Brown Act can be prepared and uh, comment on that uh, when their time is allotted. Um, I, I do wanna talk a little bit about, you know, I've only been here a year and a quarter. So uh, I've, jumped in the fray uh, and I, I can't speak to uh, what was uh, at the forefront of this committee's concerns prior to the pandemic, but I certainly uh, have heard uh, and specifically from several members of this committee uh, concerns while we're in the pandemic and where we're at today. And I do wanna explain, and I, I apologize, uh, uh, if I'm stating things that are blatantly obvious to you, but uh, the city, uh, our, our accessibility responsibilities are certainly all city facilities, all city owned property, uh, the public right of way. Um, uh, we take great lengths to make sure that they are compliant. Uh, many, of, many of the, much of the infrastructure we're dealing with was built way prior to ADA. And you're all very aware on the transition plans and it takes time and resources to put those in place. Um, uh, the, the one thing that we don't have a lot of or didn't have a lot of experience in even more importantly resources assigned to was the policing of, of private commercial activities. Uh, that does not typically fall under the purview of the city. So it's such that if a restaurant on its property, whether owned or rented, uh, does not comply with the American Disabilities Act, that's a the responsibility of a private person, a private entity to bring that attention, can, can file a claim, a lawsuit against that organization for not providing the right compliance requirements, um, but the city uh, is not typically involved um, because it's on private property. Uh, when there's an event, a special event that does take place in the public right away, we have a very 
um, specific permitting process in which ADA requirements are part of that permitting process. So they won't get, they will not be issued a permit unless they address all the requirements of uh, ADA. Um, flashing back to between mid-March of 2020 and uh, July, October, I wasn't here, so I can't give you the specific dates, but that's uh, when our economy, frankly, across the globe, uh, took a major downturn uh, in response to the uh, recognition that we were in a worldwide pandemic. Uh, certainly here in the city of Santa Barbara, things came to a stop as they did in most American cities. And uh, there was a lot of actions taken in response to that uh, public safety, public health uh, initiative to ensure that uh, uh, businesses that uh, felt the full weight of gathering indoor restrictions would have a, a chance to financially survive uh, into a future we, at that point, we just didn't know. So uh, the outdoor dining facilities in you know, State Street, as you know, was closed to, to traffic, uh, which, which uh, vehicular traffic, which allowed uh, the restaurants with the city's permission to create the outdoor dining facilities. And then in the spirit of some level of equity across the business community, um, uh, parklets were permitted, <coughs> or I should use that word, were allowed uh, under the emergency ordinance uh, in front of restaurants, uh, food and beverage facilities throughout the city. Uh, this is, all of you are very aware, was, was done very quickly uh, for economic reasons, but not with the uh, lengthy and prior planned special event permitting process. This was uh, an executive action, well, actually a uh, legislative action of the council uh, in, in order to, uh, you know, essentially save the economy of the, of the food and beverage uh, retail businesses in the city. Um, uh, and then, I think everybody understood that. They, they understood the, the rationale behind that. And then as we progressed on, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of the concerns regarding all the rules, laws, ordinances that are put in place to ensure equity, accessibility, uh, the fact that you have enough restrooms per seats in the, all those things started to come to bear as to what about this, what about that? And uh, our staff um, already hurting from a bit of the great resignation during the pandemic uh, was really pressed with resources to, to address uh, those specific items. So I think in any case, when you have limited resources and lots of requirements, uh, we prioritized uh, we addressed uh, State Street as the number one priority. Uh, as you all well know, our ADA compliance. So it became our responsibility because now they're operating, these commercial activities were operating with the city's approval in the public right of way. That makes them our responsibility. Um, so uh, that came under, come, came under us. That became a priority. As you know, I think we started with of the parklets, 44 of them were not ADA compliant, varying degrees. Some were egregiously not mm -hmm. compliant. Some were not compliant, um, what I would say minimally. I mean, it's a law, you're either you are or you aren't, but there's a difference between driving on the freeway at 58 in a 55 and driving at 85 in a 55. And of course we, just like police triage, uh, where they do their enforcement. Uh, we did that with our limited resources to address the most egregious and work our way down the list. Um, I'm happy to report on State Street. The last report, there was two non-compliant. Um, 
one of which, and maybe Chair Marston heard this from Mr. Bossy in your meeting, one of them uh, will be at the end of their rope. They've been given, we've gone through the procedures. It was, it's a ramp that's not compliant. They've not made the effort to, to repair it or to alter it, to make it compliant. And uh, um, they will be issued uh, in order to cease their operations. The other non-compliant was a new non-compliant. They had been compliant before. And, and to that end, I think, you know, many of their uh, facilities in these outdoor dining facilities move in and out, get changed every day. So one day they can be compliant and the next day a table's not where it's supposed to be. Uh, and then it's not compliant. In this case, it's a, it's the first um, uh, uh, violation. So there's a procedure we have to follow as, as dictated by the city's attorney's office to, uh, to address this non-compliance, give them a chance to, to remedy it and, and then second warning and the like. Um, uh, we have now turned, so I, that's in my view a success. In your view, I, if I can be so bold as to speak for you, it's a success that took way too long. I understand that, but it was it's uh, within our, <coughs> our resource constraints. Uh, we really did work hard at it. Uh, we are now turning our focus to parklets. I do not have a, uh, a lot of optimism that many of the most of the parklets will be able to be in compliance with ADA and also be commercially viable. Um, so uh, just because of their limited space and the ADA for path of travel and accessibility requirements for turning radiuses for uh, uh, wheelchairs and the like, I, it, it's, I think it's gonna be very difficult. So uh, we, were, we were gonna have to deal with the consequences of that as we move forward. Uh, there's other issues beyond ADA is, or accessibility as all of you know. I have a lot of concern with our stormwater ability. We've not had uh, a lot of rain, which is rather unfortunate because we really need it. But uh, for those of you who live here, all of you, uh, Santa Barbara area, you know, in most cases, our streets are our stormwater conveyance mechanism. And we have uh, structures in the storm gutter that causes a problem. So all, all those things uh, we are uh, working on, working to address. So we do have a contract, CASP, who is doing the analysis right now. Uh, it's gonna take a while because there's so many and they are so dispersed. Uh, and then we will report back as to what, what the next steps are um, as, as we go forward. Um, I just, uh, uh, one other, you, you mentioned the retirement of uh, Mr. Dewey. It was rather abrupt family situation that he felt uh, he really needed to take care of. And I applaud his decision to do that. But I uh, 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 really feel the, the loss of him. <laughs> it's just been a week. But uh, uh, he was our only uh, certified CASP on staff. Uh, I am uh, working with Mr. Demore on a plan to put forth as part and maybe even ahead of the FY24 budget submission, which uh, will identify the right professional on staff that I think will, in the right place, uh, that will address that. I can't really get into details because it's not completely soup yet, but uh, it has great support from the city administrator. Of course, ultimately it needs council approval, which I, I don't think will be a problem. But uh, we are we are working in that direction, and I will have more information to follow on that. And I think uh, structurally it will serve the city and certainly uh, the accessibility community uh, well. Uh, the the I guess the final um, point I have, and this is new guy, uh, just my observations, is I, I want to improve. The relationship, uh, you know, obviously this this is Mr. Demore's the the staff representative. It fall, this committee falls under my department, and I want to make sure I would like to improve the relationship between the department and this committee. Uh, essentially, the tenor. Uh, you, uh, as Mr. Kuntz mentioned in your earlier remarks, 
the, the, the charge of this committee is to be advisors to the city on accessibility issues. Um, uh, what I've witnessed, and, I, and for the reasons I explained prior, I completely understand it, but I, I think the, the committee has uh, kind of pivoted more to almost an oversight committee. Um, and uh, that, that's not where I want to be. I want to be working hand in hand with this committee. Uh, you bring really valuable information to us. Uh, uh, Ms. Flores is going to talk about projects and your input on how we approach those projects and make sure that we're not missing something because uh, you have only, uh, Ms. Tejada knows as an architect, you only have so much of opportunity up front and that's where you can make significant changes that'll make that facility or that infrastructure serve the public properly or as far out in the future or its lifespan. Uh, if you miss it in the, in the early stages, it can be changed, but usually with a lot of pain and a lot of expense and a lot of time. So uh, I really wanna make sure that, that we get to a point where we're working <laughs> professionally together, uh, that we respect everybody's opinions. We can certainly disagree. Uh, we can certainly have uh, um, energized discussions. It's okay, but as long as everybody's treated respectfully, and that we all understand we're on the same team. We mm. wanna achieve the same goals for the city, uh, for our community, and certainly for those people who have accessibility issues and don't want them to be forgotten. So uh, that wraps up my remarks. Um, uh, I, I can answer some questions. I gotta be careful that we don't venture into things that would need to be agendized, but uh, I, I do open it up for any of your questions. Mr. Mauer, this is Bob Burnham. Um, thank you for your, your insights here. Um, two things, if you want to improve the relationship between um, this committee and, and staff and public works, um, I'm wondering if there's a way, number one, we can, if possible, streamline the process by which a, uh, a comment or maybe a, a suggestion complaint is submitted to public works and then the whole follow through process. Um, I don't know how well that's working right now. It seems like the website, we worked on that with Scott Nelson and the web, the warp uh, folks to improve the website. And it seems like that's more accessible, but the, um, the whole pro the complaint uh, comment process with follow through. Um, I'm just wondering if if that can be tweaked at all. Uh, through the chair, Vice Chair Burnham, that, that, that's an excellent question. In this case, I actually I think I have a good answer for you. Um, the city staff, uh, with the lead of the IT director. Um, mm -hmm is working on the implementation of a uh, community relations management software. Um, and this is, we're not inventing something new. Uh, most cities have this uh, well uh, in place and we are working to implement that CRM. Uh, so that will do exactly what you're asking. It, it, it provides, uh, an avenue for any member of the public or actually, yeah, any member of the public. They don't have to be residents. They don't have to be businesses uh, doing business here in Santa Barbara. They just have to be within the area. So there'll be a electronic geofence is what they call them. So you, you can't be sitting in Orlando, Florida and put a complaint in against uh, the city of Santa Barbara. But if you're within our geographic region, uh, it, it'll allow uh, people either anonymously or uh, they can certainly provide their personal information to identify a pothole, identify a policing action that they didn't think was proper, to identify accessibility issues. Uh, the city I came from, City of Coronado, we had it. Um, if you want, you can go to the web and download Ask Coronado. 
Um, it's a, a different software provider. At first, I thought it was going to be, um, it was implemented during my tenure there. Uh, I, at first, I thought this is going to be terrible. A lot of people with time on their hands, we're just going to overwhelm staff. Uh, but it wasn't, it was fantastic. And staff could use it as well. And so my staff might have thought it was terrible because, like here, I ride my bike around town. And whenever I'd notice something that needed to be fixed, I'd stop, put in a put in a work request and, and send it off. Now staff work requests can be shielded, but all the public work requests um, uh, actually are identified and shown so people can look and say, okay, that pothole was already identified and then there's updates on it. So we're working on that. It's not gonna roll out tomorrow, but hopefully it's gonna roll out uh, within a year or so. Uh, this is uh, Skylar Kovic kind of following up. Uh, so there already is a form on the website where complaints could be submitted. Right. And in my, in my experience, that's worked well, but uh, I didn't get follow up. So like the, the tree, uh, the extended tree was actually fixed quite quickly, but I never actually got follow up. So, so you're saying there's going to be a kind of a, a new form implemented on the website where uh, there would then be a better follow up process. Is that correct? Yes, Committee Member Kovic, you are absolutely correct. Uh, this this will improve our current situation significantly because it is a, a when working properly it is a complete loop so that, that the work the, the issue is brought in, it's addressed. <clears throat> of course, not all issues raised are going to be addressed. Uh, some, you know, staff might say that's not appropriate for us. That's not our responsibility or whatever. But there will be feedback, and that's a very important part of the CRM software. Uh, and then when there are things that 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 do need to be addressed, those get posted uh, so the public can see it as well. So it's uh, it's very informative. So uh, Michael Rassler, I wanted to uh, thank you, Mr. Moore, for breaking away from your other commitment and, and making the time to be here. Yes. And also thank you for your, your comments. Uh, uh, look forward to working much closer and uh, uh, be, being of service uh, in an advisory capacity as designed. And I think that's really very, very important. Yes. Uh, words are really welcome. Thank you. Mr. Thank Mauer, my, my second point I wanted to make is, uh, I know you, you met, that's okay. You, you mentioned, um, this committee being in an advisory capacity. And one of the things we have advocated for for years is to be more a stakeholder and be included earlier on in the, the design um, planning and implementation of a new project or program or service within the city. And um, historically, <coughs> like it was mentioned earlier in the committee, the, the, there seems to be some exclusion going on that the committee is not in the loop. So I'm hoping that under your uh, watchful eye that um, we, we will be um, part of the process from, from the beginning as far as giving viable input. Yeah, Vice Chair Burnham, I, I couldn't agree more. So I, it, it all gets to uh, uh, us working professionally together uh, because your input is very important to us. Uh, this Mr. is Jim Marston. I was going to wait, but I, I want to follow through on what Bob said. You mentioned the uh, oversight. We kind of morphed into oversight position. I don't know if you know, but three of us here went to city council in March of 2020, said, what about accessibility? No one followed through. Uh, we, ended, we wrote the first guidelines for ADA accessibility just to have something there. We've never heard from department from downtown parking for any input at all. And so you can imagine after two and a half years, it gets to be a little bit dicey. If your uh, recommendations or your input to staff aren't being even looked at or acknowledged and not being a stakeholder, then uh, I think that's where we got to a situation we're in now. I'd love to have it like you want it just give good advice to staff, but then the staff have to turn around and follow through and say, thank you, we can't do this for these reasons, or we can do that. But when there's no communication at all from parts of your uh, department, that's what really gets to us. Raise frustrations. Yes. And I wanna ask you something about uh, 
there's a difference of opinion between CASP and stuff on, on this question. If you build something in the public right of way, which by the way, the city gave away for free, they didn't ask me as a taxpayer if I wanna let this guy sell beer on my street. They just gave it away with no plans, no permits, no requirements and no way to shut them down if they were uh, obnoxiously ignoring stuff. Do you think that the California building code applies to structures that are built on public right away? That's the question that can't seem to be answered. Or is it just ADA? How do you feel about CVC in public right of ways? Well, I, I, I don't wanna to get too far out of my lane here. Um, I, you know, ADA is the law. So that's it's the building code, uh, ABC requirements. Many of those were waived uh, by executive order from Sacramento. Right. And it was in, uh, the, the, I, I don't, I would recharacterize the, the, the elected officials of the city didn't just give things away. They took uh, emergency actions during an emergency um, in order uh, for the, what they felt uh, was the better good of the city. Uh, were there impacts and ramifications? Yes. Uh, and we have then started walking a lot of that back. I think the issues you brought up will continue to be significant issues. Even if they're waived, they were all put there for a reason. And I, they will be addressed as we're moving forward. The current economic uh, extension of the ordinance expires in uh, just a year and a month. Um, that's not from a city city standpoint. That's not very far away. So um, uh, th those things are being discussed right now. And I think that's given the time. I think it's probably as far as I should go into those specific issues. I know uh, committee member Luckett wanted to say something. Yes. Um, thank you, Mr. Maurer, for your presentation and time. Um, one of the things I'd like to know is if there's, because we want this communication, um, is if we can maybe plan together a launch and in service so that you, your staff and us can get to know each other and our priorities. Uh, I'm wondering if that could be a possibility to put on the agenda. I, I uh, committee member Luckett, I, I, we, we can consider that. There's some procedural things we'll have to work through to make sure we uh, stay on the correct side of the Brown Act. I, I know that this, those things can be done and properly noticed and, and alike, but I'll uh, charge uh, Mr. DeMore to take a look at that. And uh, certainly between his discussions as, uh, as the staff, uh, representative for this committee working with you. We can see what we can do. Yes. Um, another question. In the last rain, which did cause some sewer issues, did anything happen on uh, State Street with the parklets? Was there an issue at that point? Did anyone look at how the rains passed through the parklets? Committee member Luck, that's, that's, that's a good question. Uh, we did have a rain. Uh, Tuesday a week ago that was substantial. And in fact, for about 45 minutes, we had here in Santa Barbara, what I would call a microburst, a significant amount of rain in a very short period of time. Uh, in all the usual areas, our storm sewer system was, what parklets or not, was, the capacity was exceeded by the amount of water. So uh, in the Laguna area here, uh, down where Shoreline meets Cabrillo, uh, you know, as you can imagine from the, the in storm inlets there out to the ocean, very flat. Uh, they only have so much capacity, more water uh, accumulated than the, the storm system could move. Uh, it's all gravity, there's no pumps. So uh, we did have flooding. Um, uh, Ms. Clark, our uh, uh, downtown parking ma uh, manager, uh, did inspect State Street during that time. Um, other than some accumulation of debris at the, uh, at the parklets or at the outdoor dining facilities, we didn't have any specific issues. Um, 
beyond what would have been expected any otherwise. I'm not confident that would have been the case had it been essentially in a whole day of uh, on and off intense rainfall. So uh, uh, the short answer, which I've already blown, but <laughs> the short answer to your question is no, we didn't have any issues with the outdoor dining <laughs> facilities and parklets, uh, but that doesn't give me confidence that with a bigger event, we won't. So we continue to look at that very carefully. And really it's, it, it, the two things that we're most concerned about is one that the parklets or outdoor dining facilities would divert water off the public right of way onto private property and do damage. Um, and then the other is, is that, uh, that if one or more get dislodged and then create a dam, whether it's, 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 it's parklets or parts of parklets or other debris in the stormwater flow, that uh, get caught up on, on the facilities, that that could cause a significant change in the stormwater flow. And uh, that could be not only a threat to, pro to property, but it could be a threat to human life. So we're, we're concerned about those things. And then who is the one that would address um, access into the parklets from State Street proper? Because what I noticed is that some of the parklets have are now accessible from the sidewalk, but because I am, I found myself uh, mobility impaired with a knee injury. If I'm walking on State Street, I have to walk a whole block before I can get to a ramp and then walk back to access the parklet because there is no access into the parklet directly from State with most of the parklets. So who is the one that would address that kind of accessibility issue? Well, that that falls within the downtown parking or downtown team, Mr. Bossy's team. Uh, I'll, I'll, and I'd like to end here because I know I'm way over time at this point, but uh, uh, the issue there is, is because these are extensions of existing commercial facilities that the accessibility requirement has to be back to the to the uh, facility such as if if you have accessibility challenges and you want to dine in the outdoor dining facility but you want to use the restroom uh, you need to have the same path of travel that a person without accessible accessibility issues has. So that would be to the sidewalk and to the establishment. Um, uh, if we would require dual accessibility that not only back to the establishment, but also to State Street, uh, I think that would, um, I don't even think that's within our purview, but that would also uh, probably move the outdoor dining facilities just because of the space it would take up, uh, not economically viable. So the, the, the primary responsibility is back to the establishment. That's where the path of travel has to be established. Just as if you were walking to their front door. Mr. Maurer, I, I wanna uh, thank you for your time today and, and making the time in your day to come out and, and, and meet with us. And I look forward to, to more of this. I wanna thank you for your 30 years of service to our nation. Um, and uh, I just, a couple of quick comments about um, the, the pandemic. As Chair Marston said, in March, May of 2020, when the EERO was first being discussed, we were not consulted, but we had to elevate ourselves to a oversight level because we were not included as an advisory uh, element. And so we went to council and advised council that once you pass this EERO, you're creating a program of outdoor dining and it has to be accessible. And um, that you, you mentioned that there, there was no method of managing that. And there was, there's an outdoor dining licensing program already in place. And, and we pled with council to use that because we knew that implementing this EERO would unlawfully give all of these restaurants 
a way around the California Building Code and the ADA. And so to there's no other perspective I can take, but that the city chose to put those businesses economic viability ahead of my civil rights. Plain and simple, there is no other perspective for me. The last thing I wanted to talk about, I can't remember now, and I'm sorry that we're out of time. This predictably took far longer than 10 minutes. Um, so I will leave it at that. All right, thank you, uh, Committee Member Kuntz. And, thank you very uh, much, Mr. Maurer. Yeah. Are there any public comments before he leaves? No, there's no public okay. comments. Thank you so much for your time. I hope we can work closer with you. I, I share that thought. Thank you, Chair Marston and committee members. Thank you. Okay, Brian, time for the ADA coordinator's report. I know you mentioned to talk about at least two things, State Street Parkets and the update on the transition plan. Yeah, uh, Chair Marston, and uh, I'm noticing we have our consultant team in the, in the lobby. Um, they're ready to go on police station. I will try to move quickly on this okay. and we can let them know uh, during the break, uh, uh, probably an estimate on start time for that. Uh, we talked already about State Street, so I don't, I don't think I actually have much more of an update on that other than that I can say the parklets, the non-State Street outdoor uh, business operations, we've gotten the same consultant in town uh, earlier this month, M6 Consulting, They've been the one that's really helped us um, first to create the, uh, the form, the template, the uh, sort of the checklist on uh, inspections for State Street. Um, they were out here earlier this month. They did an initial, not even a full round because it, it takes a while to go through, especially the first time. Uh, and I think I heard that they hit, uh, and I believe you received this in an email update from Brian Bossy, but I'm just uh, letting, the rest of the committee know and anybody who's listening in, uh, there's approximately 70 off State Street um, outdoor business facilities. 17 of them were inspected in that one day on November 9th. Uh, so they'll be coming back throughout November and December and try to get those all inspected. And uh, as mentioned by uh, Director Maurer, there will be significant challenges getting those um, compliant. And if they can't, then we understand uh, that that's going to mean they uh, will not be able to exist in that configuration, and it, there may not be a configuration that works for them. Uh, so that that's all I had on uh, State Street outdoor business operations. Um, on the ADA transition plan, again, I think I want to be brief here because I'd like if the committee's interested. Uh, I don't know if we have an ad hoc for this or if we can do, I'm willing to do a special meeting where we focus on this item and I'd like it to be more of a, a workshop um, because there's a lot to dig into on this item. So I'll just give kind of a very quick overview and then some ideas that I have of um, where we can go on this. So in uh, 1990 was the ADA, that's when that occurred. And soon after that, 1991, 1992, the city developed uh, its transition plan as cities across America did. And then in from 2006 to 2008, we did an update, an ADA transition plan update report. Uh, that was, um, I think it has a 2008 date on it, that's available although not as available or as accessible on our website as it could be. So we're working on making some changes to that. Uh, that came at a price tag, just the update. Uh, it was $259,000. So just give you an idea. And again, that was $2,008. Um, so how have we been doing since then? Um, it's really hard for me to answer that question. I've heard that question from the committee over the years. and uh, really tried to dive through these reports, figure out, well, what, what were the work recommendations then? Um, and it turns out there are thousands of items identified in that report. It is extremely thorough. And we haven't done a great job of going into that report 
And, you know, when we do work, because we've done things, obviously, in the last, um, whatever it's been, 14 years, we've done work on items that were called out in that plan, but we, we haven't been tracking it on any kind of a spreadsheet. Uh, and in fact, until last week, I wasn't aware uh, whether or not we even had a sheet where we could do that. So I was looking at the plan or this update report and thinking, how can we get all of these work recommendations into like an Excel format as opposed to what we have on the website, our PDFs. Um, and I didn't know we had it until uh, thankfully Sarita in meeting with some staff and facilities was able to find in 2017, we created a document that's a PDF. It lists all of this work in a, in a format that would be much more um, easy to work with. Uh, but unfortunately there's no status, that's what's missing. So if we were to do a comprehensive update to that report, we'd be pretty much looking at that same effort that took place back 2006 to 2008. And again, you know, that price tag was $259,000 then, you know, it's going to be more than that. And I've heard from the committee over and over, we don't want to just pay for another document that's going to sit on the shelf. So I understand that concern. What I'm thinking is we can look at that report. There were a number of facilities that were looked at in much more detail. And I assume there was a process back then where those locations were prioritized. It's City Hall and the City Hall Annex, Central Library, Eastside Library, Cabrillo Arts, Cabrillo Pavilion Arts Center and Eastside Bathhouse. This is just what they were called in this report. Uh, community Development and Public Works, that's this facility. Westside Community Center, Mackenzie Park, Alice Keck Park Memorial Gardens and Police Station. There were nine listed, but this report looked at facilities throughout the entire city. Um, if there's more interest in deploying the funds, and there are, we have a pretty good amount of money from last year's money, some that rolled over, and then this year's appropriation for ADA transition plan. Um, if the committee's most interested in deploying the funds into capital improvements, I think the way to get there would be um, to have um, a separate meeting, agendize the item, focus on this, bring in the appropriate staff from other uh, divisions, departments, and try to work with the committee and develop prioritization on, I don't know if these are the nine most important facilities in the city, maybe they still are, maybe something else is now, but to get like a top, I don't know, three to five facilities and then go to the transition plan that we had from 2008, get, get a consultant out here who can look and see what's been done, what hasn't been done. Maybe even staff could do that if that's often the limiting factor though, availability of staff um, and deploy the funds to um, actually making those improvements happen at those targeted facilities, as opposed to if we update the whole document uh, that's going to just be a monumental effort, uh, which it would be a good effort, uh, but I would only want to see that done knowing that there's going to be money on the back end of it to do those improvements. And we, the track record from the last time was uh, the document, unfortunately, has sat there. So that's just kind of my update here. I'm very willing to do... Um, some kind of a special meeting or workshop yeah. where we can work closely together uh, on this particular item. I support the, the idea of having a special meeting. I have a number of comments, questions that I'll, I'll defer to our, uh, the, the, our guests that are waiting patiently for us behind uh, schedule. I would, I would like to see that we have a special meeting as soon as possible, you know, certainly before the end of the year, um, I think that the it could be Zoom, and I think that the the primary uh, the first thing we need to do is have a an ad hoc committee so that we're not you know stuck 
between special meetings and quarterly meetings or we would just yes. get mired in this forever. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I like the direction you're, you're looking. Um, and I certainly would much rather see the, the budget going to address the things we already have identified rather than redoing that effort only to have it sit on the shelf again. I, I think the, my biggest concerns relate to policy and procedure that, that is documented in this update that's not being followed. Uh, Skylar Kovic, I have a quick comment. Uh, so yeah, I, I think the, the special meeting is also a great idea. As uh, one of the uh, examples of uh, you know, improvements to these facilities that still need to be addressed, uh, at Cabrillo Pavilion, uh, I was going to a uh, independent living resource center banquet and the signage was a big problem for where I should be dropped off by my wife who is not going to the event and where like, you know, if I'm calling someone to tell me, uh, you know, to, to meet me at the drop off so I can figure out how to get into the building, which is new to me. Uh, so I, it would be great if there was a path forward to make minor improvements like that to several facilities rather than focusing on just one or two. Uh, but yeah, it sounds like that would be the purpose of, of the special meeting. I would, I would look forward to being a part of that. And that, that really speaks to my concern about policy and procedure. This is one major capital improvement that was on the, uh, the, the nine uh, priority facilities that was recently done. And, and that signage was noted and it was required under this project but it was overlooked and, and that happens way too frequently. Um, we, even, we even had the architects here and we said, please put in accessible ramps, which they didn't do, an accessible wheel uh, elevator, which they didn't, they have an elevator now, but it's only to, for staff. So it doesn't help the public. So that was a place where it was a breakdown. I'm gonna finish in here in a second. I've been pushing for this transition plan for years and years because we know that there's many places that the city has even fixed, such as the south side of the library. I keep bringing that up. No one ever took the time to just say, hey, this is now fixed. So there's no one looking at what have we done? And Jim Dewey had a good thought. He said, why don't we have a deal where all the staff from the city who actually finalizes a project just goes and says, hey, I actually fixed two ADA requirements from the transition plan and have some central place where you can say, we fixed that, we fixed that. This is all uh, like the elevator at the library is in the plans, okay? So you can take that off the plans or say in progress. We don't do that. And many things are like just enough, no blue curbs around the buildings or no tactile domes or inaccessible uh, tables lower counters, those things cost minimum to do. So if you can get that list that you said Sarita found. Can I also share on, on that point, Jim? And, and I apologize, I, I do wanna move on from this, uh, yeah, but I, I asked did. Mr. Maurer if he would stay to hear this. Um, and you know, I recently reviewed the transition plan uh, again, and uh, there's a number of issues that are common to nearly all of those nine priority facilities that seem to be really easily remedied. And, and many of them are in the public right away. There's a lack of required tree grates on the adjacent yes. public right of way. And, and I think that uh, Mr. Dewey has proven that the flexi pave is a good inexpensive solution for that. And he was just looking for opportunities for where that could happen. So if we could look at the public right of way adjacent to those nine key facilities, that's, that's some low hanging fruit that we should be able to knock off quickly. Um, and, and there's the um, on-street accessible parking zones were noted as, as required at all of these facilities. And I don't believe there are at any of them. Um, and again, the streets operation says it's, it's practically trivial to paint a curb blue now. So we, we should be doing that. Um, and you know we, we did get six new blue curbs on the 0 100 blocks and that's great, they're getting used. Um, and we should be looking for new opportunities to expand that. Um, and there's a lack of detectable warning or the tactile domes at the adjacent driveway entrances. And those are all public right of way issues and why I asked Mr. Maurer to be uh, here for this. Um, but the tactile braille signage 
in, in all of these facilities. Um, seems like we don't need a capital improvement, a major capital overhaul to, to fix these little things. And, um, and there's also noted uh, inaccessible picnic tables at all of these locations. And I, I don't know um, about the procurement uh, history, but I'd love to. I'd like to know if any of those uh, picnic tables have been replaced since 2008, uh, and if they were done so with or without um, accessible picnic tables, because it, it, it would be great insight into our, you know, policies and procedures um, that may be overlooked, and we just need a little bit more awareness and training. Staff gets turned over so frequently. How can they keep up with all of this, right? Okay, I have one last question. Um, right, Mr. Demore. Um, Taken as a whole, this whole document is, seems overwhelming to anybody that would look at it, but you've identified nine priority projects. Let me ask you if you can sort of project, if, if you were to take a look at one, look at the transition plan and then look at the changes in let's say city hall or the central library, how long do you project that such an inspection would take an hour, a week, a month. I mean, if you were to break it down, let's say one by one, let's let's approach this, let's approach this. So can you give me your best estimate? Uh, committee member Luckett, that's a great question. I was asking myself that as I looked through some of these uh, last week. It kind of depends on the facility, of course, uh, but it, it also depends what exactly that person would be asked to do if they're just verifying whether or not uh, the condition has changed from 2008. I think that could be done in a day on each of these facilities. But then if something was done, verifying whether or not it was done to meet code is another kind of question. And that's when you need somebody who has a little bit of expertise to make that assessment. Um, so a little bit of an engineer or a cast, or... ideally it would be a cast. Okay. Yes. Unfortunately, we keep CASPs losing our casts. Uh, all of the casts that we have right now are in community development. So I don't think that they would be available for something like this, but we have this consultant, uh, that we've been working with. There are other consultants out there, um, and they would be able to spend, um, more time than a city staff person with all of their other assignments would be able to. So if we out. were to prioritize, could this be done by let's say next December? I would think so for the, if you're talking about these nine facilities, but that's why I wanna have uh, more of a discussion with the committee and figure out, yeah. th this is just what was handed to us from 2008. I don't think okay. anybody here was involved in that process. So these may not be the priorities today. Okay. <laughs> Well, I would certainly think if, if, if I was looking at those nine and I, I see that um, the East Beach Caprio Pavilion uh, was recently it had a major renovation overhaul. And um, I, I would think that everything on the transition plan should have been addressed during that construction. And so that should be the easiest to confirm and uh, the quickest to, to uh, bring into compliance. Mr. DeWart, um, just real quickly, I highly recommend a special meeting. And I think if you can call it um, through Zoom, I think we can get everyone together and probably have a more flexibility of, of dates. But is, is it possible to do this before the end of the year? Uh, Vice Chair Burnham, it, I would say that it's possible. I <laughs> hesitate for a moment because I know uh, Sarita King will be out for a lot of December, so I don't want that to hold us back, but uh, we all know how much uh, she does for this committee and for the city. So um, I'll look into that and see uh, if, if we're doing it over Zoom, obviously that's gonna be a lot more uh, flexibility. I'm off all next week, so that really leaves, I think, uh, three weeks before the extended break uh, over the holidays. Right. Thank you. Well, in the interest of time, let's uh, close this down. I hope you can give us some dates so we can have this. I think everybody's in favor of having some kind of a special meeting on that. And an agenda is uh, having an ad hoc, please. Yes. 
Okay, we're running public late. Comment. Right. Public comment. <laughs> yes. Are there any public comments on this ADA coordinators report? No, there are no public comments. Okay. Can we have a five minute break? We'll be back here and here about the police station. Sounds good. Thank you. And then do a quick brief introduction and uh, and then I'll turn it over to Jeff for running the presentation. As I said, um, my name is Brad. Um, we uh, started this project four and a half years ago. Hard to believe, but true. Went through uh, quite a bit of um, time selecting the site. And most recently, we've received uh, our entitlements from both planning commission and city council um, selecting the site as what is currently the Coda commuter parking lot. And uh, we've changed the address from a Coda address to a Santa Barbara street address. So it is now 601 Santa Barbara street. Um, most recently on this past Friday, we received preliminary design approval from ABR. So we are now in design development. We will be about 25% through DDs uh, at the first part of the year. Um, so it's an exciting time, lots of uh, <clears throat> decisions being made. Uh, our systems are being studied and selected. So uh, very exciting time. Just a brief uh, um, update on our timeline. We're hoping that we'll have a building permit in early 24, 2024, which would then allow us to start construction probably in the neighborhood of four to six months after that, because uh, after a building permit, we'll use the approved, approved permitted sets for uh, the bid package that goes out and selecting a contractor. That would then mean a completion date in mid to late 2026, depending on how things go. So that's the overall timing. Um, that's the location. And Jeff is going to I'll walk you through the slides that we've prepared today. So thanks again for having us. We appreciate this opportunity. Thank you, Brad. Uh, again, thank you for having us and letting us show you the, the latest plans for the police station. It's exciting. Um, so we're happy to uh, share them with you. you. Turn your mic on. It is on. Well, let me get closer to it. We're not hearing it. Down a little bit. <laughs> okay. There, there we go. Thank you. Um, so this is a photo of the existing police station, which was built in 1959. Um, I'm sure that you all have heard a little bit uh, over the years how um, insufficient it is. Uh, they've completely outgrown the space. Um, structurally, it has issues. So it's uh, definitely um, time for them to, to be in a new uh, state-of-the-art facility. So we're happy to be providing that for them. As Brad mentioned, we went through a site selection process, um, looked at uh, uh, quite a few different sites, um, narrowed it down to two sites, um, and it became um, evident pretty quickly that the new police station needs to be in the downtown. Um, if it were anywhere outside of the downtown, um, there would need to be a substation provided, um, and that just becomes you know, insufficient um, in terms of uh, you know, having staff in separate locations, the cost of, of building, you know, multiple facilities, et cetera. Um, so this is a map showing the downtown area. Um, the existing station um, on Figaro Street is highlighted. Um, and then the new station on Coda, uh, corner of Coda on Santa Barbara Street is uh, highlighted as well. Uh, this is an aerial uh, uh, photo of the site. Um, Coda Street at the bottom of the image and Santa Barbara Street uh, up and down on the right-hand side. Um, this shows the Coda commuter lot, um, which houses the um, uh, uh, market on Saturday morning, the farmer's market on Saturday morning. Um, uh, there's a, an existing commercial building uh, to the west um, where Antioch University is. Um, kind of kitty corner to the northwest, there's a condominium project, and then to the north is a 
parking lot for the state uh, building. Next slide. Um, so the site is uh, 1.61 acres. Um, and as you'll see with the plans, it's, you know, it, it, it is a tight site, but we're able to fit everything in and it's, uh, it's working out, I think, quite nicely. Um, this is a site plan um, showing the uh, layout of the, of the building. So essentially it's an office building, um, which is oriented to the corner of Coda Street and Santa Barbara Street. And then adjacent to that, to the west, is a secure parking structure for uh, staff. Um, the parking structure will house um, personal vehicles as well as um, all of the fleet vehicles. Um, the public entrance um, is at, uh, to the office building is off of um, Santa Barbara Street. Um, there are also eight parking spaces uh, that are adjacent to that. Um, the site obviously is, is you know, fully accessible. Um, and, and one thing that's interesting to note, the, um, uh, you know, along Coda Street, it's, it's pretty flat. Um, but as you move up Santa Barbara Street, there's actually about a four and a half foot difference in grade from the corner um, up to where the um, public entrance is. Um, that's really one of the main reasons why we, we put the uh, entrance, the public entrance where we did, um, you know, if it were down at the corner, we'd have, you know, grade issues trying to get up to the first level, um, which is, you know, four and a half, five feet out of the ground at the corner. Um, so it, it just, it, it makes it, you know, much more accessible and, and um, you know, that's one of the, the goals of this building is to be, you know, um, open and accessible to the public and, and not, you know, sitting up above and, and have this, um, you know, um, feeling of, of not approachable. And um, so that, you know, that was one of the uh, kind of goals of, you know, site planning this project. Next slide. Um, so this is a view um, from Santa Barbara Street looking toward uh, a rendering, excuse me, um, of the new station looking uh, toward the uh, public entrance. So on the right-hand side, um, underneath the tree are the eight public parking spaces. And then uh, there's a, the elevator tower. And just to the right of that is the kind of two-story uh, glass, which is the public lobby. Um, and the um, public parking area and the uh, pl uh, plaza outside of the lobby are, are designed to be able to function as, as um, Kind of outdoor community space so the um, PD can have you know different events um, outside if, if um, you know from from time to time so that's one of the nice features uh, about this new building. Next slide. Um, this is a view uh, looking toward the the new building uh, kind of directly across Santa Barbara Street. Um, so we've we've kind of purposely created two-story massing along the street and then set the third floor back um, so that it's you know, a little bit more apparent as, as two-story massing. Um, and then the, the story up at the, uh, uh, that is set back has um, quite a lot of glass, which is gonna provide some, some pretty incredible views for the tenants. Next, next slide. Um, this is another view um, from the corner of Coda and Santa Barbara Street looking toward the building. Um, so again, you can see that third floor set back um, and there's a um, kind of a covered deck on the second floor, um, which, you know, helps to sort of break down the massing at the corner. Um, but that is also an outdoor fitness space uh, for staff, um, uh, you know, so that they can be outdoors, you know, have incredible mountain views, but it's also, you know, protected um, from the public. Next slide. So now we're, we're moving down Coda Street, um, looking at the building. Um, again, that third floor set back, um, showing kind of the, the two-story massing along the street. Next slide. Um, now we, we are a little bit further down Coda, and this is where the parking garage um, becomes into view. Um, we spent a lot of time and worked with the ABR on, on really making the parking garage not really look like a parking garage um, so that it, it you know, has a bit more, um, 
you know, uh, pedestrian uh, connection and a little bit more um, uh, activity happening. Next slide. And this final rendering is from further down Coda Street, looking uh, at the parking structure. Um, on the left, you can see the main entrance into the uh, into and out of the parking garage. Um, this is a secure uh, entrance um, where most um, vehicles will enter and exit um, from the station. Um, uh, and also we are maintaining the uh, bus stop that is existing along Coda. Um, so there, we've sort of created a little um, sort of pocket park, I guess you can call it, where the new bus station um, is going to be designed and located. Um, and we also are um, relocating the uh, Lincoln School plaques that are on the existing station um, into the new design of this. So that's an important piece of history that we're um, you know, integrating into this new building. And I believe that that's it. So um, I think with that, we'll open it up for any questions. And Mr. Hornbuckle, this is Bob Burnham. Uh, where is the dispatch center going to be located? The dispatch center, um, uh, Commissioner Burnham, um, is located in this new building. Um, so currently, it's currently the the uh, police station is separated into four separate locations. So this new project is bringing all four of those together into one facility. Um, so the the dispatch center will be um, in included in this building uh, on the third floor. On the third floor, okay. Because I know the current one is it was down in the basement with no windows and it was fairly somebody told me who worked there years ago and it felt rather claustrophobic yeah and hopefully this one will be more uh, user friendly for the dispatchers because those folks do amazing work they, and they they have to be on on their game constantly you know and answering calls and so hopefully this will improve their environment Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's very important for them to have a, a controlled work environment. So, you know, lighting control is very important. Right. Um, the amount of sun, you know, the direction of the sun. So locating them up on the third floor on the north side of the building, well, they'll get, you know, no direct sunlight, but have, you know, the opportunity for, um, you know, north facing light, which is um, really nice, um, is going to be you know, such a benefit to them. They also have um, a outdoor space uh, that's located directly off of their space so that they can go out for kind of quick breaks um, and, you know, have the ability for fresh air and good. So uh, they'll, they'll have a mountain view. It's they're going to have an facing. incredible mountain view. Great. Good. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, thank you for your mic. presentation. Microphone. Turn your mic. Turn on my mic. Okay, thank you for your presentation. Um, it looks really beautiful. Thank you. Um, I'm so glad that people get access to the outdoors easily. That's a really nice feature. Um, I don't know if you pointed out where exactly the accessible parking spots are on these drawings. Sure. Yeah, go back. Yeah, right there. So um, is there? Yeah, there we go. So Brad, actually, Brad, if you want to first point to the public entrance to the building. Um, so there is right at the mouse there is the public entrance. There's kind of a public courtyard out in front. Um, and so the eight public parking spaces are just above that um, there, all along there. Okay, so and the, how many of them are accessible? Of there's, the there's one accessible space of the eight. Oh, wow, okay. Is there any on the street at all? Uh, parking or accessible spaces? Accessible. Um, no, not there's not any on the street. No. Okay. Is there any on street parking at all on allowed in front of the building? So on Santa Barbara Street, that's a great question. We've actually um, widened. You can see we've widened um, the uh, sidewalk and the parkway. Um, for a couple reasons. Um, one is to prevent um, people from parking in front of the building and, and the potential to do harm. Um, and then it also just creates, you know, a much kind of grander um, sidewalk 
um, up to the main entrance of the building, um, as well as you know added landscaping um, as a kind of a foreground to the building. And if I could actually chime in here on this view right here, which is the one where you're across the street from Coda looking up Santa Barbara Street, you can see how the parkway was widened. You can see the sidewalk all the way up to the entrance. Yep. A couple of reasons, as Jeff alluded to, for safety reasons, you don't want vehicles ramming into the building. So this, um, you'll see boulders all the way along. Yep. Those are gonna be the impediments as well as some additional items in front. Um, and as Jeff alluded to, when uh, everyone associates it with the Oklahoma bombing, where you drive up with a bomb in your car and yep, if you right. have a place to park, then that allows that to happen. This will eliminate that. Very much appreciate the, the safety concern. Uh, I'm just looking at, you know, there's a problematic, there, there's a problem in, in a lot of growing cities with the lack of parking, right? And Santa Barbara is not uh, exempt from that problem. And I see you only have uh, eight public parking spaces and I'm concerned that that's probably insufficient. Um, I, I note that there's the, the required one, ADA van accessible, at least I hope it's van accessible. Yeah. Um, I, I'm curious what, I'm sure you've heard this be from other boards, right? The, the planning commission or the ABR probably shared these same concerns. So what is the plan for parking? Do you think that eight is sufficient? We do. So the current um, station has zero uh, public parking spaces mm -hmm. aside from the on street spaces that are yeah. out in front. Um, so yeah, we, I mean, we do feel that this is sufficient. Um, there's also the um, public parking lot um, that is on um, Anacapa Street, which is uh, a block away. Block away. Okay. Um, so, you know, if there were any larger community events that, you know, that uh, public lot is available for, um, for parking as well. So if I may also chime in on that, the, uh, the issue of circulation and uh, how many people actually show up at the police station, you wouldn't, believe it or not, it's not that many. Right. So um, this is not uh, a result of um, a design limitation. It's actually based on the data provided by the police department as to how many spaces they feel like they need for the public um, because of the numbers that they see. Yeah. yeah, and they're typically very short term, right? It's somebody coming to pay a parking ticket. They're there for, you know, that's why there's the 15 minute spaces out in front of the station right now, because that's kind of the average length of a, you know, a public visit to the station. So. Okay, can I ask another question about the, um, the public lobby? Is, is there um, a, a bathroom off the public lobby? There is. The public? Great. There is. Awesome. That there's a severe lack of wheelchair accessible yeah. bathrooms in the downtown area. So I'm glad to hear that. Uh, one, one last question. Did, did you involve a CASP in the planning of this project? Um, we have not, but we will be bringing on a CASP um, probably within the next um, month or two. Okay. Yeah. As, as Mr. Maurer pointed out, you get like one shot at this, right? And so that's important to get that right from the start. Um, has, has anybody on, on the project reviewed the ADA transition plan uh, appendix for the existing uh, police station to make sure that all of the uh, concerns with that facility are addressed in this facility? Um, well, I'll answer that. Okay. Um, the, the short answer is no, because until about 25 minutes ago, I didn't know it existed. So yeah. I'll make sure that we review it. But I will also say that going from approximately 28,000 square feet in four locations to 65,000 square feet in one location, and with everything being compliant, um, I'm highly confident that we are meeting and exceeding the expectations. Um, but we will make sure of that for sure. I appreciate it. I, I would, I would, uh temper your enthusiasm for, for that confidence because I, I have witnessed at the, the recent reconstruction of the East Beach Pavilion where numerous ADA uh, 
shortcomings were overlooked in a major renovation. So if I may, this is a renovation and a new build are, I think are quite different. So yeah. let's just, you know, keep yeah, that I in mind that this is a new building and, you know, a lot of those issues that are involved with a renovation, um, you know, are, aren't going to comply. Or I, gonna, I get it. They're yeah. two totally different animals uh, and, and the code compliance is different. Yes. I, just, and I think that, the, the ADA transition plan on the existing police station may not be that instructive on, on this because it is a complete, yeah. completely different building, but there may be some general concerns that that would be instructive. I don't know. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. And how many parking places are in the underground garage for handicap? So in the underground part. So the, the parking structure itself is, is fully secure. So it's only for um, PD staff okay. and fleet vehicles. So the, the underground parking level doesn't actually have any accessible spaces um, because it's, it's all, they're all fleet vehicles, um, but the other floors do all have accessible spaces. Uh, when you arrest someone who's in a wheelchair, uh, how do you get them into here? I'm just curious. I'm sure Jeff doesn't know. I don't. I don't arrest anybody. <laughs> number <Okay>. one, but <laughs> um, when someone is um, detained, um, the uh, temporary holding cells are down in the basement. Um, so they would drive their vehicle down into the um, basement level of the parking garage, which okay. connects directly to the temporary holding area and so they'd be brought directly in okay, one, uh, one of the holding cells is accessible and okay thank you yep are we going to hear from flowers at all are they here they are not here okay uh, any questions from the committee any uh, public comments or questions? No public comments. Required. Okay. So just to summarize, the we were going to hear about accessibility, but since the plans aren't done yet, there's really not much accessibility to, to show us yet, right? Besides the parking spots, of course, the bathrooms have to be accessible and all that, but are, what, are there we, anything you've done for accessibility that you can I, mention? I mean, you know, to this point, um, you know, the site design is is pretty far along. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned, the entire site is accessible. The, you know, public parking spaces, public entrance, public, all the public spaces obviously are fully accessible. Um, the secure portions of the building are all fully accessible, bathrooms, um, you know, the list goes on. Um, okay. So it's, it's fully, fully compliant, absolutely. I, I really appreciate the presentation. Thought, Thank you. Uh, yeah. You did a great job and you know, certainly an improvement that our uh, our officers all need and yeah. you know, hopefully the, the community as well will value and appreciate it. And you know, as, as you laid it out, it, it, it it's a whole different world from where we are now and, and being spread out and bringing it all under one roof is, is pretty nice. Yeah. Thank you. Well done. Just curious, but what's the plans for the old site, the old building? Um, it's a great question, and we're still looking into that. Okay. We do have some time. Well, this is a great project. I really appreciate you bringing it to us. I, I hope we might get another look at more detail about accessibility before the boat sails, right? Yes. In Absolutely. terms of the interior yeah. space planning? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Any other I questions? Yes, I'd like to ask, is there any way to translate this architectural drawing into Braille for our uh, visually impaired members on the committee? Um, so this presentation um, actually has, I, 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 excuse me for not knowing the, the proper um, terminology, uh, alt text um, embedded into the presentation. So um, if you if you view the presentation and and um, you can receive that that alt text audibly, but that's the, that's the probably power, a better PowerPoint. Yeah. Yes, the PowerPoint. If it, if there's enough text description, like you said, alt text, that's probably a. What do you think, Skylar? Maybe that's a better 
medium for us to view it rather than Braille? Prob probably. Uh, yeah, it depends on. Uh, yeah, I, I haven't. I haven't really. It, yeah, I mean, it, it's hard. It's hard to render a map that way. If, uh, yes. Like where things are compared to, but but yeah, for for certain, uh, for certain parts of it, I think it would it would help, like okay. just to understand what the what the additions are. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's only, of course, Bob and I are of course able to get on the computer and things like that. There, there might be other blind people who who are not. But could I ask a a, a favor then, um, if if you have an opportunity to review uh, what we put into the presentation, and you still have questions or you still feel like something is unclear, would you please just let us know? Certainly, we'd be happy to do that. Will we see the presentation only when the minutes come out, or have you sent this to the committee already? The presentation was sent already. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Well, it, if, it's just to clarify, it's the same presentation. Right. It just has the alt text okay. built into it. Yeah. Sounds great. I'm glad that you're thinking ahead. <laughs> all right. So there's no other questions. Uh, thank you all, Jeff. Good and job, Brad. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate it. And now we come to Alexis. Thank you for waiting for us for so long. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Thanks guys. guys. Take care. Thanks, Jeff. Take care. Too. Nope, not hearing you. Is it on now? There you go. Oh, hello. Um, committee members and chair, my name is Lexis Flores. I'm a project engineer with the Streets, en Streets Engineering Group. Um, and I'm here to provide an update on Streets Capital projects that have recently been completed or are going into construction shortly. Uh, so first off, the downtown De La Vina and Eastside Community Paseos project. Uh, this project is about halfway complete with the downtown De La Vina portion being completed. Um, this project includes a buffered bike lane down De La Vina Street um, from Haley to Carrillo. And then along that corridor, also curb extensions. Um, so improving pedestrian crossings along those intersections and also at Victoria and De La Vina Street. Um, as well as Chapal and Haley Street. Excuse me, are these the bulb outs? We've got curb inspections? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, they essentially shorten the cross, crossing right. for pedestrians. Yes. Um, and then the other half of that project is the Eastside Community Pacific Project, which is upcoming. Um, two curb extensions have been completed uh, near Santa Barbara Junior High School uh, at Nopal and Quarantina Street at Coda. Um, and then I just HSIP Cycle 9 project, um, the hardscape improvements are mostly complete. Uh, these are located at Bath and Sola Street, Bath and Victoria, Canon Perdido and Nepal. Um, and then lastly, to be completed at Salinas and Old Coast Highway. And then our fiscal year uh, 21B pavement maintenance project. Uh, highlights for this project would be just over 70 ramps being reconstructed. Um, as well as five retrofitted ramps. Where were those? Oh, I'll go over the locations okay. right now. Yeah, <laughs> they're quite, quite spread out, but I'll okay. highlight the main okay. corridors. Um, uh, so uh, ramps and sidewalk improvements, um, mostly in the San Marquen neighborhood, uh, ramps and sidewalk improvements along Santa Barbara Street from Constance to Arriaga, uh, ramps on Chapala from Pedregosa to Mitchell Torrena Street, and also um, a section of widened sidewalk along which I'll turn a street near Castillo. Um, and just starting into construction is the Olive Mill Roundabout project. Uh, soon to follow will be the West Side Community Paseos project. Uh, this project will uh, feature two main bike routes through the West Side neighborhood along Gillespie Street and San Pascual Street, as well as pedestrian crosswalk improvements um, along those corridors and then specifically near um, Harding Elementary School. Um, and that project is planned to go into construction in uh, mid and late December. And of this year. This year, yes. So coming up pretty quick, which is exciting. It's a big project. Um, in the new year, we have the State Street Undercrossing Project and the Cabrillo Roundabout Project upcoming. Um, and also upcoming is the fiscal year 22B Pavement Maintenance Overlay Project. This project um, is planned to construct 
86 access ramps and retrofit 26 access ramps. Uh, locations mainly um, ramps along Garden Street from Los Olivos to Anna Pamu Street, Olive Street from Victoria to Ortega Street, um, on Chapala Street in the downtown area, and along Haley from Bath to Nopal Street. And finally, the Modoc Multi Use Path Extension Project, uh, which will connect from the recently completed Las Positas Multi Use Path to uh, County Right of Way. And that project is planned to be completed with the fiscal year 22B pavement maintenance project. And those are the all the updates I have for you today, but I'm happy to answer any other questions. Ms. Flores, this is Bob Burnham. Um, two questions. Um, you mentioned the um, the route from De La Vina and Haley down to Cabrillo, one of the first things you mentioned. Can you um, go over that routing with me? Because I know De La Vina doesn't go under the go over or under the freeway. So what was the routing there? Yes. So for the downtown De La Vina portion, it's essentially a road diet uh, from uh, Carrillo to Haley. And so that is to uh, create a buffered bike lane through that route, which will connect then to the existing Haley Street bike lane. Oh, okay. I thought you said Cabrillo. I, I misunderstood. Sorry, Carrillo. So Carrillo to Haley. Yes. Okay. My second question is, is there any um, project in the wings to repave Chapala from Sola down to the freeway? Because that that's, uh, I know they've repaved it from Sola to Mission, which is very nice, <laughs> but from Sola on down to the freeway, it basically is still very rough. Yes, I would have to check on the limits. Um, that sounds like maybe something near the uh, limits of the FY22B pavement maintenance project. And usually when we are constructing ramps, we're also paving in those same locations. So I believe it'd be uh, nearby that area, but I'm not sure on the specific limits. Uh, Skyler, uh, so, so, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm still pretty new to the kind of city management aspect. Uh, there, uh, so I, I had heard that there's gonna be some new lights on Sola Street, which would include De La Vina, but is that a different department? Like, like you're doing more of the, the pavement and uh, curbs and ramps, and then a different department is doing street lights? Uh, a lot of our projects will include lighting. Sometimes it's- um, I guess I mean traffic light. Uh, oh, not, signal yeah. lights? Yes, yeah, traffic signals, yes. Uh, yeah, street lighting, separate, but also would be included in these projects. And yes, the uh, West Side Community Potatoes Project is including uh, traffic signals along that corridor that you mentioned. I have one question, uh, let's see. It's my recollection that you repave Carrillo from the freeway east all the way to Chapala, I think. Yes. Correct? And I've noticed the one section between Chapala and State is still in bad shape. Is that included in your list of stuff for this upcoming? And if not, why not? It's, I ride my bicycle down there sometime, and there's a lot of cracks. So I'm just curious. Yeah, uh, I'm... Unfortunately, not as involved in the pavement maintenance projects uh, okay. anymore, but I can definitely check on that section. You said uh, Carrillo uh, and from Between Chipala State, State and Chapala. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Brian or Cliff, do you know anything about that one section that seems to be ignored? I do not. Okay. Uh, we can look into that. All right. So uh, just to review how many... Uh, Curb cuts were being done for the new uh, cut and overlay sections. The, the, the streets that are being repaved, they're, they're getting their uh, curb cuts done. Did you have a number for uh, that? Chair Marson, I heard 86 yes. on the 22B yes, project. Yes, for curb ramps, yes. Okay, thank you. And that, what was the date again for starting that project? Um, I believe probably in, uh, I think they wanted to go out and like, February, March timeframe. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? Are there any public comments on the update? No public comments. All right. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Flores. Okay. Gosh, we only almost finished on time. <laughs> Not really. Okay. Uh, this is for the subcommittee. Uh, 
reports. The first one I have listed is the annual report ad hoc committee. And uh, I think someone should just briefly uh, tell, I think Brian aware of what we did last year. I'd be happy to give a quick overview. Okay. Um, no, we noticed that uh, Ms. Shu was not really aware of the annual update um, and um, we jumped in uh, with the ad hoc and, and helped to uh, do the heavy lifting for her. Um, and um, I feel it was a, a pretty good collaborative effort. Uh, it went well. Um, and um, I hope that we can be so helpful in the future. I, I think we, we chipped in more, more on this one than, than we have in the past. Um, and, um, and I felt it was a huge success, actually. Yeah, so you're here. And Nick, in fact, Nick, I think you and I and Jim all contributed at the city council meeting when Ms. Shu presented her report, which is very well not only presented, but the content I thought was um, much in keeping with what we helped uh, put together with her. Yeah. So thank, thank you, uh, the two of you, for working with me and um, helping her do that. Yeah, I think she did a real good job. And I was very impressed with how most of these city council members had some very, very good questions yes. to ask. So it was a good give and take. It was very positive. So anyway, Brian, I know you did more of a, your on your own, but there's a group here that would be willing to help you if you need any extra. Absolutely. Oh, and, and Karen contributed uh, visuals for the presentation. Right. Yes. Yes. She happened to be out of town the week of the, the yeah, city council meeting. Yeah. I second that. Uh, I think a, a collaborative effort of an ad hoc uh, joined up with the city really put together a nice report together. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next one listed here is a sidewalk ad hoc committee, which we used to uh, work with Jim Dewey on this. Right. He was very good at looking at safety issues on sidewalks. So uh, I have no report on that, but I would like to know, you said... Uh, I would recommend, Jim, just real quick, that I that we um, contact uh, Derek Bailey and try to set up a, a meeting with him to review and discuss um, current and future uh, projects. Yeah, I, I hope we can continue that that continuity. It, that was uh, a place where uh, staff did engage us for for input and um, and. We were making some some marked progress, although sporadic. Yes, that's true. Uh, to me, that's a lot of work for Derek to do in addition to his traffic stuff. Do you think he's going to stay there in there? Or are you going to look for someone else to take over that particular sidewalks and stuff? Do we know any? Uh, uh, Chair Marston. What we can say right now is we'll talk to Derek and remind him about this great work that Jim was doing with the, the committee and hopefully, okay. um, I don't know where he carves out the time, Yeah. Uh, but ultimately uh, we're looking at how to fill those positions um, okay. and uh, don't know what that's gonna look like right. at this point in time, but we do wanna continue um, the work that Jim had been doing with this committee okay. uh, and of course with the ad hoc. I just didn't want to jump on Derek all of a sudden and give him more, more work to do because I, I know that it's a lot more, but I hope we can do something there. And I think Nick mentioned the flex pave that Jim was putting down in these tree wells. And I don't know if you guys understand how dangerous it is to have these two and three and four inch drops into yes. a tree well if you're visually impaired or in a wheelchair and, the, and your wheel goes off. This is a very cheap, simple way to make the city more accessible. And to me, there's no excuse not to find the money just to do this flex pave stuff. So I hope we can uh, at least look at that. And as you probably know, there were some tactile domes in this town who that were the wrong color when installed. And the ones down at the California Hotel still haven't been fixed after four or five years. They were incorrectly installed. And uh, Jim said he was looking at epoxy paint, but that still wears off. So. I hope we can get a, a real decision on the city that we're not going to allow illegal or non-compliant tactile colors. Well, well, we did have a decision. I hope that we maintain that continuity moving forward. I, I feel like you know the 
they agreed uh, here at, at a presentation that they were going to use yellow. Yes, they, but when they don't put yellow in, then we're stuck because no matter how many times you bring it up, nothing right, gets changed. Right. So, so yeah, okay. And I, I just, I, I, my concern is for policy, procedure, and 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 continuity. Right. You know, we we make headway. People understand the problem. They agree to you know follow the the proper procedure, and then they move on. And now we got to retrain somebody else, and and uh, I, I hope that we can find a way to bring Derek up to speed and, and make sure that we we don't have to refight this battle. If I can just jump in real quick on the detectable warnings, because I was definitely involved in that process. We updated our city standard details a number of years ago, and every single project that's gone out to bid since then has required uh, the federal yellow, as it's called. Uh, there were some uh, projects before we implemented that change that uh, were approved with some other contrasting color. And um, therefore, you know, there's this period of time now where we've got other than yellow out there. Uh, then there was another issue that occurred with one of the vendors where um, the color was fading and they agreed to come back. And basically what they did was painted them. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think for the most part that has held up. Uh, this particular example on State Street, I think it was um, city facilities went out and did the painting and that held up for a while, but that's a pretty uh, aggressive environment being right down there by the beach. So I think Jim was looking at other options for that location, but um, anything new certainly will be yellow. And as we have opportunities when we're doing overlay, we're uh, bringing uh, existing mm -hmm. facilities up to compliance. Okay, thanks for that. I think what, what I remember was the California hotel was designed by city public works with no contrasting color. So it wasn't a question of it's not yellow. It wasn't contrasting. They were pink and pink. So I think that was the problem there that they, to me, they were not uh, correct in the first place, but thank you for getting into that. I'll be taking care of that for us. Okay. Uh, isn't, isn't that a, a building code violation that we could report? Well, it's in the public right of way. So you get that problem again. Is it building code or is it? Uh, Public works. That's why I was trying to ask that we follow yeah. CBC in the public works. Yeah. And that's always a, a weird place to go because you can't get a definitive answer on that. But anyway, Blue Curb Parking Ad Hoc Committee, that would be Nick Kuhn, Suzanne Tejeda, and Karen Lockett. I don't think we have anything to report uh, other than uh, I. I missed a, a beat. We had started talking about having a meeting before this one, and um, and we we didn't follow through on scheduling that ad hoc committee meeting. Yeah, I apologize. My schedule's been overbooked. It's quite all right. We're all volunteers. We're doing the best we can. We'll we'll have a meeting before uh, the next uh, meeting here. Yeah. With with a report yeah. on. Uh, yep. But there's been. And, you know, I think we probably already talked about it a, a few times, but the six new blue curbs on the 100 block, that, that's been positive, and hopefully we can keep that momentum up. And whenever I go by there, they, they seem to be being used, so yeah. I think we're very much needed. Yep. Now, I'll ask Mr. Ressler, you have busloads of people Correct. coming to town. Yes. Are they big enough for that? Or yeah. Ours, ours are usually, you know. One or two people, I would call them the vans. Okay. You know, uh, only one or two people at a time, but yeah, absolutely. Okay. It's working much better. It has. You've uh, taken advantage of them. Yes. Okay. Better. Please well, keep, as often as we can. <laughs> okay. Please keep the, the needs of your group <laughs> in our forefront. Okay. Uh, thank you. I thank you. That. And I appreciate the work to get those done. And we we need to have some more. So get to work. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, the last one is the Outdoor Dining and Parkless Ad Hoc Committee. That's uh, Karen Luckett, uh, Suzanne, and myself. Okay, what I have to say is um, I found there's still issues on Coast Village Road. I will be taking some pictures and uh, submitting them to the city to check into the accessibility issues. Do you mean the one up on the hill or on, 
on downtown there, Montecito. There, there's you? one in the Coast Village Road parking, and there's one in front of a restaurant okay. uh, that I mentioned to All you right. at Coast Village Road. Then, I'm done. Okay, so I was walking around a few weeks ago, and I saw one of the parklets off of State Street. And by the way, there's like 70 up there and they have never been checked for compliance after two years. So I was really pleased to see that someone was changing one of their parklets. So I wrote to Brian Bossy, manager of the uh, downtown crew. And uh, he did uh, say that they had actually gone out with your CASP. He said they also took uh, some of the staff. And I, originally we've been told that it's just gonna be a one man show the cast would be there, would write up the reports and do all the paperwork. But I guess that hasn't come to fruition yet. But so as cast and staff went out and he visited 70 or 17 of the 70 parklets. I don't know which ones they are yet, excuse me. So that was on November 9th. So it actually got started. So I was really grateful to see that. Now, we'd also been told or promised that uh, there would be, be a streamlined activity instead of having to go through these inspection after inspection after inspection, violation checkups and stuff. But Brian said that still uh, working with the city attorney office on trying to streamline how we can get these people either to comply or to be shut down. And I know Mr. Maurer said that he uh, would guess that many of them can't really be going forward because they, there's all these space requirements, right? Traffic and spacing and trying to make it uh, accessible. They might not be there anymore. So one thing I'd like to know if you guys can answer it, is there any uh, teeth to this inspection that they can say, I'm sorry, you're not going to be able to keep this here. You must remove it. Do we have any teeth at all or? Is it just going to be round and round and round? Uh, Chair Marston, we do have uh, Ms. Clark from uh, Downtown Parking oh. in the in the room, uh, and she's she can provide more detail to that. Uh, thank you, Chair Marston. Um, yeah, so you know, it, it's not. Uh, it wouldn't be our call to make that to say that you can never make this accessible. So if we go and we do an inspection, which, as you noted, are already underway and, and we're scheduling those out now for the next few months, basically every week. Um, so if we go and we observe a, a parklet that is non compliant, uh, they're issued a correction notice and they're given a chance to to correct that. So. If they are able, you know, they are free to consult with their own CASP. They're free to bring in, you know, an, an architect or an engineer or somebody who might specialize and, and figure out how they might be able to reconfigure the design to make it uh, compliant. Um, but that the onus is really on them to sort of figure that out and make that determination. And then, you know, if they're not able to do it, um, then they would be found non-compliant at subsequent inspections and uh, be asked to remove that facility. So uh, thank you for that update. But are you saying after one inspection, they're given a notice of violation, if they can't fix it within the two or three weeks time, then at right at that point, they'll be told to remove it? Uh, so they have to be subjected to enforcement actions. Okay. So it would be, they get a couple of chances and okay. then they would be uh, so it's a given violation, a reinspection, second uh, inspection. Second violation. And then after mm -hmm. the second violation, they can be removed. I believe so at this point, as as uh, as you noted earlier, we're still working with the city attorney to make sure that we can do that, but we are working on streamlining all that paperwork so that we can get through I'm that great. process more quickly. <clears throat> so that's still being worked on though, this the streamlining part. Yes. Okay. No, but that's one layer better than it was. It yes. Then you know, two full inspections with two opportunities to correct. And then after the third, you know, you could take action. So I think what you just described has in fact shortened it up. Yes. Well, it, it will if, if still be approved. it will still be at least two inspections. It's right. just we're working on condensing um, sort of the paperwork part that happens after the inspection in between, so that we can sort of shorten um, that time frame. Excellent. Now, is the cast still going out with just a checklist now instead of having to write out in longhand what the, the violation is? They just do a checklist to hand it to the person. 
Uh, Chair Marson, yes, that's correct. So we have streamlined that particular form to make that part of it quicker. It's still going to be a fairly time consuming process to get through all of these. Um, as you noted, we are able to do about 20 inspections uh, the first day of going out. Uh, there are about 70 parklets we estimate right now. So um, we are expecting that it'll take probably four separate inspections. Um, each, each one is basically four hours. Um, to get all of those fully inspected the first time. So, you know, we're right now sort of inspecting. So we're making sure we're doing follow-up inspections on the ones that have already been inspected and then scheduling the first round. So it's it's going to be a process, but, you know, we're moving forward with that. I probably missed something. What, what took four hours for the whole 17, you're saying? Correct. Okay. Yes. And that four hours per place. Correct. Okay. Yes. So Thank that's you. that's roughly what we can get done in, in one afternoon. Okay. And we generally do them in the afternoons sure. because for the food service, that's when most of them yeah. are open. So well, you're you're a fourth of the way through in, in one inspection. So that's good news. I appreciate that. Um Oh, and the last thing I was going to say, and you probably have more information here, Brian Bossy told me that the fee for the rental, as they call it, I guess, is going to come up to city council in December. Is that? Uh, Chair correct? Marston, right now we are scheduled to go to finance committee on December 6th to discuss how those fees will be set and uh, what that uh, revenue ultimately would end up being. Okay. And that's a yearly fee, is it? Uh, so right well, now the fee structures but that was per the year? fee structures that have been proposed are a monthly uh, fee. Yeah. So at this point, we we are going to be giving the finance committee some options for different rate structures, um, and they'll be that's what they'll be evaluating and, and giving us guidance and direction on. Okay. In December. Yes, December sixth. Right now is when we're tentatively scheduled. You know, barring yep. uh, any unforeseen circumstances. Understood. Thank you. And uh, I'm glad to see there's going to be some rent, hopefully recovered, that'll help your your group uh, do better enforcement and also cleaning and stormwater management and stuff, right? That money will all go to one pot, correct? Uh, yeah. So the way that we we set up the sort of proposed options for, for different structures, uh, for fee structures, mm -hmm was by starting with the amount of money that we're currently spending uh, to operate the State Street Promenade specifically. And we also added into that the cost of about uh, a one half time person basically to do ongoing compliance uh, and, okay. and, and working with those issues. And so ultimately it'll be down to city council as to where they, you know, sort of what they wanna fund and how much revenue they, they'd like to collect through that program. But that was included in our proposal, yes. Well, I guess I guess that's all I have for the update with Brian, but it was very good to see that some work would be done on the off State Street. I, I want to share that appreciation. I know this has been a contentious issue and um, I keep up the good work. Thank you. And I guess the last uh, Ad hoc we're here is uh, discuss what you want to do at the valet parking problems with uh, people parking on green well, or we, blue we, spaces. Yeah, we didn't get our, our agendized discussion, so we haven't really right. have I, nothing to report there. I, I guess I could I, report that we are going to meet with Emil about. Okay, because I told you that Brian had said that he could set up a meeting with Emil, right? Uh, I, what we were hoping to do, Chair Marston, was uh, we had an agenda item that uh, was targeted for today. Uh, a bunch of staff from community development ended up being out today, right. so we pulled that off the agenda. Uh, we can circle back with them. I already basically asked that we um, reserve their calendar for, I forget what day, the next council meeting or the next. Uh, well, I have that here. That's February 24th, but I want some action before that so yeah i agree and my was, thought is just yeah. ask him what can he do about enforcing the people who are parking on blue spaces in right. private lots so what what is his obligation Ch chair marston it it depends what the violation is in terms of who can do the enforcement and for certain things it could be pd for certain things it could be community development in certain other cases it's just purely a um 
a civil issue. Uh, so what I've been in conversation with the attorney's office on this, what we think could be effective, uh, and I'm definitely open to this, would be uh, drafting a letter that basically spells all of that out that we could share with the operators that, um, cause they may not be aware. They're they should aware. be. I've made them aware. Mm -hmm. uh, but a letter coming from the city's yeah. ADA coordinator that uh, spells all of that out uh, could be helpful. Okay. It would, would not hurt. And I think it would be helpful in formulating that letter just for us all to understand the, the nuances for different types of violations, what that means. Well, we talked about that letter with Ashley before. So do you have a time frame on when you can actually get to this? Because I think it's important. City attorney and you as ADA coordinator should reach out to those people and let them know here are the rules. Either it's a public works violation or it's a building department violation or zoning violation. Otherwise they just act like, oh, we don't care. This is this is another area where you know we're we're not able to uh, we're, we're getting into a little bit of an oversight right and um, I appreciate that frustration for staff um, but we've had members of the public over many years come to us and and express their concerns over this and and I think that there's an obligation for the city to get involved here. And, and we've been talking about how best to do that for quite some time. Um, and, and it just seems to, um, we get the same answer. We, we don't have a clear path forward and, and frustrations are, are rising over that. Uh, and I, I think that's where the frustration transitions from an advisory role to oversight where some members of the committee you know, take it upon themselves to uh, you know, tell the staff how to do their job or uh, what they could be doing differently or better. And there, it's a fine line between you know, advisory and, and oversight, but our job is not oversight. We advise, we give them the input, and then what staff does with that, whether we like it or not, our job's done. We've done the advising. That's it. And we have to respect that. And we have to understand that there are other priorities. There are other issues. We're part of the puzzle. We're not the puzzle. We're an important, a critical part of the puzzle, but we have a role and it only goes so far. And, and it's very frustrating, I think, both for members of the committee um, as well as staff and you know, anyone in the community that is online listening to this. It, it's, um, it, it's really important that we all understand and stay in our lanes appropriately. Uh, that is, I think, our best way forward to really be helpful, requires patience and perseverance. And what, what I've seen in the last couple of years, a uh, perseverance is going to trump patience. And this is a committee that will persevere and will stay on task on whatever the issue is. But we also have to have the patience to understand, you know, the, the, the wheels of progress grind slowly sometimes. Yeah. Uh, Brian, so uh, what was, was there a definitive answer on getting a hold of Emil or getting a list of which groups could solve these problems or how are you going to, what do you need uh, from us? Chair Marston, uh, we're committed to having this on the agenda at the next meeting. Uh, that's a long time from now. Uh, I am interested as the ADA coordinator in developing a letter that we could use and uh, send that out to our known ballet operators. Okay. I hope that would help to be effective. Um, uh, it's one tool we can use. It's a fairly uh, easy one to do. And I think in drafting that letter, um, it would be helpful, helpful for us all to um, understand what we're after with trying to bring community development in because there are just a, a piece as we were talking about earlier <laughs> with the puzzle. Um, there's different types of violations that could trigger different uh, types of enforcement action. So uh, next agenda or next meeting um, plan would be to have it on the agenda, but to, to look for some action um, to take place between now and then. And I know there is an ad hoc committee. So depending on um, 
what happens in my work with the attorney's office on that letter. Maybe we have an ad hoc um, meeting between now and the full committee meeting okay. in February. Yeah. Yeah. And we talked about also about having a Zoom meeting about something, right? Transition plan. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you'll keep us in posted, I think. Yes. Okay. I think that's it. Just a reminder the next meeting is Friday, uh, February 24th. And I'm going to adjourn the meeting. Motion to adjourn. Second. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Jim.